The Big Apple has had its fair share of historic moments, without a doubt, but not all of them are proud ones. New York City hasn't always been the most welcoming place, especially to members of the LGBTQ community. In fact, even as recently as the 60s, solicitation of same-sex relations was considered illegal in New York City, if you can believe it. From the late 1800s up until now, the fight for LGBTQ respect continues, not just in New York City, but in different parts of the world. New York City, without a doubt, has one of the largest and most prominent LGBTQ populations in the world. The ability to speak freely of your preference and be who you wanted to be wasn't always widely accepted, especially here. Going as far back as 150 years, history would show us that while it wasn't being spoken about publicly, lots of people waited for the day they could be themselves, free of judgment, and without fearing arrests, prosecution, or worse. Looking for places to express themselves freely, businesses like Edward Baths in the city's Chelsea neighborhood would serve as a judgment-free zone, with many visiting the location looking for a place to be free and meet others just like them. Further down by Bleecker Street and Broadway, you had Faf's Beer Cellar, a popular hangout spot for artists, actors, and writers. Among those writers was Walt Whitman, who would become famous for being one of the only people at the time to openly publish poetry detailing his love for other men. Out in Staten Island, famed photographer Alice Austin would spend a majority of her life taking photos at her grandfather's farm, now designated as a national site of LGBTQ history. Her photography would include images of women embracing each other, lying in bed, and dancing with other women. Described as a rebel who broke away from the constraints of her judgmental environment, she also broke many boundaries, showing life through the lens of a lesbian woman. Following the aftermath of World War II, many people in the States felt like they needed to bring back the social order that existed prior to the war in an attempt to stop inevitable changes from taking place. There was a big focus on anti-communism and hearings would be conducted searching for communists within the U.S. Army, government, and anything else they felt fit the description. The U.S. State Department would add the gay and lesbian community to this growing list, making them targets since the government deemed them security risks. Over the coming decades, federal job applications would be denied, thousands were discharged from the army, and hundreds were fired from their jobs just based off suspicions that they were gay. The paranoid and closed-minded ideologies of politicians all over the country decades ago would strongly influence years and years of mistreatment and injustice. One of the most important establishments during that time was the Stonewall Inn, a gay club located in Manhattan's Greenwich Village. The location was known as a hotspot for LGBTQ individuals, welcoming anyone and everyone who felt connected to the movement in some way, a place where all could express themselves openly. The New York State Liquor Authority would penalize and shut down any establishments that served liquor to people who were suspected of being a part of the LGBTQ community. In the early hours of June 28th of 1969, New York City police raided the Stonewall Inn, armed with a warrant. Patrons were physically removed from the location by force. The bootlegged alcohol was discarded, and 13 people were arrested for violating the state's quote-unquote gender-appropriate clothing statute. Since the Stonewall Inn was one of the few locations that welcomed women who dressed like men and men who dressed like women. During the heated interaction, a lesbian woman was struck over the head by an officer. Onlookers were further agitated and began to throw bottles and cobblestones at the cops. It would take but a few minutes before a full-blown riot broke out, prompting weeks of protests demanding the respect they deserved, just as importantly, a change for the better. While these are just some of the memorable and defining moments of the LGBTQ movement, these days the movement is running strong and representation is everywhere, shredding the negative image driven by ignorance all those years ago. Today on Evil Intentions, the story of Steen Fenrich. Steen Fenrich was born on September 13, 1979, in Dix Hills, Long Island. He was born to his mother, Wanda Gray Fenrich. Steen resided in the Bayside section of Queens, New York. He was described as a very popular and driven young man with a list of goals he wanted to tackle before going out into the world. Friends said he was very friendly and very active. 
The funny and charismatic Steen attended Half Hollow Hills East High School in Dix Hills, Long Island before graduating. While in school, Steen would spend his time with the many friends he'd made both in and out of school. He could often be seen playing basketball with his friends and stepfather, John Fenrich, a carpenter and former member of the U.S. National Guard. If Steen wasn't on the court, he could be seen by neighbors making his way through the quiet Bayside neighborhood, rollerblading or jogging. No stranger to physical activity, Steen was no doubt getting himself ready and keeping himself in shape for his next plan after graduation, joining the Army. According to the family and a U.S. Army spokeswoman, Steen joined the Army in July of 1997 at the age of just 17 years old. He arrived in Fort Jackson, South Carolina at his base and held the title as a food service worker. He was honorably discharged in April of 1998 for unspecified reasons at first. Although as time went on, it would be learned that at some point, a letter was found in Steen's locker indicating that he was gay. The discharge paper stated this as the reason for being discharged. After leaving the army, Steen would return to the home he shared with his boyfriend in Bayside, Queens. While Steen was working hard to continue developing his own identity, his family's previous run-ins with the law would follow him, and his stepfather's actions throughout didn't help. In October of 1999, the Fenrich family found themselves in hot water when they were arrested for staging auto accidents and falls at certain businesses and parking lots. Both John and wife Wanda, 52 years old at the time, pled guilty to several counts of federal mail fraud. But what makes this particular story so different from others was the sheer amount of effort that went into making these false accusations seem like reality. John Fenrich, on numerous occasions, mutilated himself. He lacerated his own earlobe, slashed his own groin, amputated his own finger, and said that these were injuries he got in the car accident. The couple was facing two years in prison for each count. Clearly, Mr. Fenrich had no issues taking things to the extreme just to prove a point. While the family had mounting issues with the law, John and Wanda's lives would become a lot more complicated a few months down the line, when Steen disappeared without a trace. For seven months, Steen was nowhere to be found and was never reported missing. His friends and loved ones hoped for the best and prayed for a safe return. But in March of the year 2000, just a few short months into the new millennium, new gut-wrenching information on Steen's disappearance would come to light. On that Tuesday evening, at around 5.40 p.m., a man was walking through the woods near Oakland Lake in Bayside, Queens, when he came upon two large plastic bins. One was empty and the other was secured tightly with a bungee cord. The man let curiosity get the best of him and decided to investigate the contents of the bin. It took him no time before he spotted a skull, a foot that had been previously refrigerated, and other shattered bone fragments. The foot still had decomposing flesh attached to it, but the skull, the skull was a different story. The skull was, quote, picked clean of any flesh. The back of the skull had been smashed in, indicating this person was hit with extreme force by something heavy and blunt. The city's medical examiner explained that due to how clean the skull was, it seemed like it might have been rinsed with acid or bleach. Upon closer inspection, stunned medical examiners couldn't believe what they saw. Gay and racial slurs were written all over the skull, words that are much too hateful to repeat. If you think that's as disturbing as the story gets, well then you'd be wrong. Also written on the skull was a nine-digit social security number. The acid that had been used to clean the skull also ruined the enamel of the teeth. Therefore, dental records couldn't be used to identify who this victim might be. So of course, authorities went to their next option, pulling up the social security number written on the skull. The number was traced to Steen Fenrich at his old address, 75 Oakfield Avenue in Long Island, the home of his parents. At around 11 p.m. that same day, authorities went to the home and broke the terrible news to Steen's mother and father. John Fenrich and his wife were distraught at the news and cried when detectives informed them of Steen's discovery. John would tell detectives that the last time he saw Steen was when he dropped them off at his boyfriend's house in Queens. He also stated that his son came out to him as gay and this was something he did not approve of. Sometime before 5 a.m. the next day, Fenrich dialed into News 12, Long Island's local news channel, and told them that detectives had left his home after telling him of his son's passing. He went on to explain how distraught he was and that he was going to hurt his family, meaning his wife and other son that they shared, John David. He told the person on the other end of the phone that they found his son, quote unquote, chopped up, and he just couldn't bear the pain of such a heavy loss. 
There was only one problem with this particular statement. Detectives never told Fenrich that his son was dismembered, so how did he know? This led to the station calling NYPD and Suffolk Police. They visited the home on Oakfield Avenue once again. Authorities spoke to Fenrich for about an hour and he appeared to be calm. As he sat there, clad in sweatpants and sneakers, things were starting to add up for authorities and they told Fenrich he needed to come down to the station for questioning. He agreed to accompany them to the 111th precinct in Bayside. But as the detectives and couple made their way to the front door, Fenrich made a break for it and ran out the back. He ran up to his roof where he had a handgun and a high-powered rifle hidden under a tarp. His wife and other son were able to escape the home. As Fenrich fired warning shots into the air, he'd hoped that the cops would shoot him and end his life. Fenrich began screaming that he was a bad father and that he wasn't there for his son. He let him down. He failed. Basically, I heard him say that, uh, how could I do that to my kids and stuff like that? I did hear him say something in reference to that. Over the course of the almost eight-hour standoff, Fenrich would also go on to implicate himself in the murder. While he didn't give out a flat-out confession the way some news sources stated, it was clear that this entire ordeal was due to extreme guilt finally catching up. It was him who attacked Steen, struck him in the back of the head with a blunt object, dismembered him, tore the flesh from his bones, and bathed him in acid to clean them. Given the savage nature of the crime and the entire ordeal quickly getting worse and worse with this standoff, Detectives had no choice but to question why he would do this. Just him knowing about his son's dismemberment without them ever telling him was more than enough to make him their prime suspect. According to John Fenrich, Steen and his boyfriend had a big fight and it resulted in Steen losing the lease to his home that they shared in Queens. When Steen met with his stepfather John, he explained to him that he needed to move back home in Dix Hills since he had nowhere else to go and the army was no longer an option. The news of Steen's sexual orientation apparently enraged his stepfather, who had suggested Steen join the army in the first place. Given his own military background, it isn't hard to believe that John Fenrich would want Steen to follow in his footsteps. But rather than be accepting and supportive of his son's preference, he instead took it as a sign of disrespect and feared that this news would spread. He feared that the news of having a gay stepson who was discharged would cause him embarrassment among the rest of his old army friends. Although Steen was being true to himself and wanted to continue life on his own terms, he didn't get support from his stepfather. Steen's mother even expressed her disappointment with John, since he never treated him like a biological child of his own. He also had a strange and well-hidden hatred for Steen because he was black, while he was white. Scary because his other son and wife were also black. John, who was pointing fingers at Steen's boyfriend earlier on, attempted to throw cops off with this deceptive information stating the boyfriend is who needed to be looked into. But some of Steen's friends knew just how strange John could be and how he treated Steen different from his other son. At one point during the siege, Fenrich stated that he would only speak to his brothers, both members of the New York City Police Department, one being a detective, the other being a sergeant. But it did no good. Suffolk police were determined to bring Fenrich in after all that he said. And at 1.25 p.m., as Fenrich walked back and forth on his roof, he lost his balance and began to fall, but as he fell, he grabbed his pistol, put it to his own head, and fired one critical shot, ending his own life instantly after the lengthy standoff. Fenrich was rushed to Good Samaritan Hospital in West Islip and was pronounced dead on arrival at 2.04 p.m. The events that took place at 75 Oakville Avenue on that morning sent the fear into the surrounding community that they'd never felt before. To have a neighbor end up in a standoff with officers only to take his own life for everyone to see is one thing. The deep and closeted hatred this man had for his own stepson, however, would spark an entirely different yet relevant debate. Why wasn't this labeled a hate crime from the very moment authorities learned of the motive? Whether it be because Steen was black or because Steen was gay, he was killed for being who he was and wanted to be. He was killed because one of the closest people to him didn't agree with how he lived his life. 